and welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss the interesting facts about each species and debate which one we think is the best. Of course, we think all marine mammals are awesome. This is just our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy this series, and if you want to hear about a particular marine mammal, let us know in the comments. And without further ado... All right, welcome to the next episode on Marine Mammal Highlights. Uh, this week, we are doing a fun one because we're doing the weird ones. <laughs> Weirdo day. Right, and by weird, we mean that they're marine mammals, but not ones that you would think of being necessarily a marine mammal, right? You think seals, dolphins, sea lions, whales, things like that. But today we have these other ones that are marine mammals, um, but we don't really think of them like that. So mine is the, well, we'll call them otters. We're mainly going to talk about river otters. I know, strange, marine, but river. Um, and then I'll tell you the differences between that and sea otters because they are different. So that's mine. And then I am going to be talking about the polar bear. So again, bear. <laughs> Wait a minute. Does it count? Does it not? We'll find <laughs> out. I don't know. Mine yeah. makes more sense. I'm doing the serenians, which are the dugongs and the manatees. Right. So but they, they look like seals, but you know, they're not. Yeah. And they kind of get left off the, like there's always dolphins and whales and seals. Yeah. And I feel like. Yeah, I feel like unless you live like in Florida or Australia, you kind of forget about either of those being in existence. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They're cool though. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start off with the river otters. So again, river otter, kind of a misnomer <laughs> because they can go into um, freshwater and saltwater. So, you know, you think of them as being by rivers and streams and ponds and things like that. Um, but they do often, if they're on a coastline, will jump into the salt water. It's just like us. We can go in freshwater. We can go in salt water. It doesn't matter. Um, so they can do uh, both. And we actually have a little family of them that lives in our study site that we get to see every so often, which is really fun. Um, so I'll just cover real quickly about the difference between a river otter and a sea otter because yeah, that'd be a good that's one of the big, big things. Yeah. So usually when you think of an otter, I think most people think of this cute and adorable sea otters, right? Um, Cause they get those cute little faces and they just go- and Super like, fluffy. Super fluffy and they're just adorable. And they're big rafts. <laughs> right, and yeah. the big rafts are all holding hands and they're the big rafts <laughs> and the kelp, you know, super adorable. Um, but they're actually both in the uh, family must, uh, mustildae, 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 there we go which includes weasels, badgers, honey badgers, martens, minks, polecats, and wolverines. Honey badgers? Yeah, honey badgers. Honey badgers. <laughs> they are nice. Awesome. Um, so, but the main differences between sea otters and, and river otters is the way they swim and their tails are the, the biggest things. Um, so if you, a river otter basically is on land and on sea, but a sea otter you'll almost always only see in the ocean. They don't really come to land much. Um, it's kind of like the difference between seals and sea lions because river otters are really good at walking on land and running around. They're very agile and sea otters are not. <laughs> they, can't, they don't really move that well on, on land. Um, so the, uh, so that's one of the main things. So if you see and you, and when they're in the water, if you see it on its back with its belly up and its face out of the water, that's a sea otter. And if you see a river, uh, when you see a river otter, they will be swimming um, like a dog or a cat would with their back up and they swim with their webbed feet. Um, the other difference is the tail. So a river otter has a really long tail, like a third of its body length um, and it's round. Um, and the sea otter has a more flattened paddle-like tail. So for the most part, um, especially here in the Salish Sea, if you see an otter, it's most likely a river otter. Yeah, we only have a couple here, don't we? Sea otters? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and and both of these have been hunted close to extinction, particularly the sea otter, because the sea otters have the densest hair of any mammal ever. Um, <laughs> it's like one million squares per uh, hairs per square inch, 
Wow. So if you've, if you've never felt one, like the first time I got to feel a pelt, I was like, I understand why they were hunted close to extinction because <laughs> wow. Um, so they, um, uh, so since they're both hunted, um, the sea otters have been extirpated, which means they're gone from this area. Um, they're in California and Alaska and Russia. Um, they have tried to reintroduce them in different places, but they, they just don't take here for whatever reason. And I think like mm -hmm. Trevor was noting, we have like one or two, I think down in Puget Sound. Yeah, uh, I think there's like one in Victoria that's known. Yeah. I think so. Right, yeah. Someone said they saw one up, up here in the islands and it was somebody that I would trust in knowing what they were talking about, but we used to um, work in near the San Juans, we had a possible sighting, but we couldn't confirm. Yeah, oh, so cool. I think yeah, they're, 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 so there may be one weirdo that's <laughs> trying to make his way up here or her way. Um, so that's the difference between a river otter and a sea otter. So sea otters are, are more typical marine mammals; they're in the water all the time and and whatnot. But river otters are a little different, like we talked about. Um, so they will live on land and sea. They will basically take dips into the into the water. Um, they're like half uh, half to a quarter of the size of sea otters. Sea otters wow. are like 50 to 100 pounds and river otters only 20 to 25. Huh. Yeah. So, and they look a bit more rodent-like. Like sea otters, you don't think of a rodent, but river otters... Yeah. People call them rats a lot. <laughs> yeah, they're really yeah. big rats. Yeah. Well, and they, they will hide out under <laughs> rodents of usual size. I don't know. <laughs> there um, you go. Yeah, they, um... They will make dens in many different places, including like underneath portable units. Um, where my husband, where my husband works, they do that, and they're very loud and they're very stinky, smelly, smelly. Um, so, uh, but they uh, are able to, you know, um, we'll see them running around on land quite often. Um, they only live about eight to nine years, but they can up in captivity up to twenty-one years, which is oh wow, that's a really big difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and so they have, uh, when they give birth, so sea otters give birth, they only have one pup because they have to like sit there and hold it and they're in the water all the time um, versus the river otters have up to four pups and sometimes maybe a little bit more than that, but average of like two to three to four. Um, and they're blind and helpless when born, unlike the sea otter, because if that happened, they would just drown. So, so sea otters have to be able to swim kind of right away. But river otters, um, they're blind and helpless, and they will swim. They have to learn to swim, and they do that at about two months of age. Um, otters are really cool, and we talked about this with the seals and sea lions, but they also do what's called delayed implantation. So they can basically mate, have an egg ready to go, and say, hold a tick, wait a second, and anywhere from days to months later can go, okay, no, I'm ready to have a baby. Um, one thing that I looked up at the river otter it was like nine to 11 months that they could wow. hold it. Yeah, the sea otters were less. Interesting. Uh, but the sea otters have like a six month gestation period versus the river otters having a 60 day. Um, Got it. Okay, so they could afford to hold it for longer because they'd have a baby quicker. Right. And it makes sense gotcha. then too that it's only 60 days. That's why they're born blind and helpless versus right. having more of that development inside like the sea otter does. Sure. So it's not ready. Um, so they eat lots of different things, fish, frogs, crayfish, snails, rodents, birds. Um, Trevor actually was out in the field the other day and got a really awesome picture, which I'll um, put on the blog post, uh, of this river otter pulling this fish that was probably about oh, as big yeah. as the river otter was. <laughs> did you see, did, I couldn't, did we figure out what, what fish it was? I'm fairly certain it was a lingcod. Okay, yeah, that, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. He just he dragged it onto the beach and struggled with it and like, made sure he wouldn't get away. I won't make it, <laughs> I won't get it here. Um, and that's important because they have a really, both otters species have a really high metabolism. So they have to eat regularly in order to um, maintain that. So for insulation, they have really coarse fur and they have a fat layer um, versus the sea otters, which have, um, they don't have blubber. Um, they just have that really, really dense fur. Um, and so the river otters are found alone or in family groups. Um, and they are anywhere from what, the Washington coast up to Vancouver and to Alaska. And we occasionally will see them in the Strait of Juan de Fuca um, near Port Angeles, but not much farther inland than that. But in our region within the Salish Sea, they're everywhere, ponds, streams, coastal areas. Um, so uh, just like with uh, sea otters, because of that, that fur is really important in keeping them dry, um, they have to groom a lot. So that's what you'll see if you see them at the zoos or something like that, or aquariums, they'll just be like, I'm grooming, I'm grooming. One of the, one of the, uh, descriptions was squeegeeing 
So, oh, oh, funny. Sneak <laughs> there. Oh. I thought that was kind of awesome. Um, so these guys are very playful. Um, you will see them uh, again. They'll get on your boats <laughs> if you've left stuff out, or if even if you haven't, they just feel like they're having uh, fun, enjoying messing with your stuff. I mean to say um, hi. Yeah, and leave some poop usually too. Just people, there a lot of you'll see a lot of uh, posts like on Facebook and stuff about like how do I kindly make the river otters not come onto my boat or onto the <laughs> thing. They're, they're not trying to hurt them. They're just like, I would rather have them not be here. Um, but they're very, then so that's why they're very popular at, zoo, at zoos and aquariums because they're quite uh, energetic. Um, and so they communicate with whistles, yelps, growls, scr and screams. Those are apparently very vocal. Yeah. It's like, ooh. And we, I mean, well, a lot of times when we see them in the field, they're almost, it's almost like a little, like chirp. a chirp that they're yeah. kind of doing like back and forth like almost like a little squeaky chirp back and forth with one another yeah i guess that would be i would maybe consider under the whistle section of that probably yeah thing. but yeah but it's just like a little yeah like it's quite high pitched yeah. from that giant rodent okay <laughs> <laughs> sure um and the reason why they're stinky is because they have scent glands near the base of their tails and it's a strong musky odor and so they someone described it as you wear from like uh, uh freshly cut hay to rotting fish. <laughs> I'd go more on the rotting fish level. I don't know if yeah. I've done smell the uh, fresh hay smell. Yeah, I that was I was like, okay, everybody has different <laughs> smells. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and one thing that when we were at one of the conferences that I learned that I didn't know about, which I thought was really cool, is that they have latrines. Mm -hmm. So they don't poop where in the you know wherever they have a specific spot and they go and they poop in it and then they go out. So they're actually quite clean mm -hmm. in that respect. Um, and it actually is really good for research because if you find those latrines, then you can go and collect a whole bunch of scat. And we talked about scat before. Um, that poop is really important in being able to tell us a lot about these animals. Um, and finally, they can stay underwater for up to eight minutes, although most of the time it's a shorter dive time. Um, they can close their nostrils so water doesn't get in, and the sea otters are the same way. Um, but on land, they can run up to 15 miles per hour. What? Yeah. That's that was, crazy was, fast. What? Yeah. And, and the, then the, the, the side note was they can slide even faster. <laughs> <laughs> so like when it's snowing and stuff like that, they're like, Wee! <laughs> wow, that's nuts. Yeah. Do you know if river otters are positively buoyant? Because I know sea otters are, because they, like, they kind of struggle to get down and they just swoop right back to the surface. Yeah, right. I think some of that has to, they, they, they trap air in the, in the fur, right. which also helps to keep them warm. Yeah. Um, I don't know about river otters. I would think that they would be more active swimmers, so That's what I, I don't think they would be positively buoyant. I think they, it, well, they might not be either, but I would lean more towards negatively buoyant, I would think, to help them die. I would assume so, yeah, just with the, the, the you know, how their fur is and right. Yeah. yeah, and they're not like trapping, they have, they have some fat layers, so they're not trapping air to keep them warm. Yeah. So uh, that's a good question, though. That is very good. Um, all right, I think that was uh, it. I think I'll leave um, some more. Maybe we'll talk about the sea otter in more in depth another time. Um, since that's yeah. a regular marine mammal. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so that's that's my cool uh, river. And that's those are my dogs. If you can hear them in the background, I apologize. <laughs> Somebody's walking by the house, so therefore. All right, so now we got the uh, polar bear or the dugong slash manatee. Who wants to go? We can up? talk about those. Keep the comparison going. The polar bears <laughs> or, or the the dugongs? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go for it. All right, cool. So yeah, their dugongs and manatees are in the Serenia family or order order, what? and then that comprises the Trichetidae, which is the manatees, and then the dugongidae, which as the dugongs, which makes sense. <laughs> uh, the extinct stellar sea cow. Oh, right, the sea briefly. cow. That it's one crazy. used to live up in Alaska, where the confirmed sightings, mm -hmm. but near the uh, islands, the island chain of Alaska. And dugongs and manatees get about 10 feet maximum length, but these guys got like 30 feet maximum length. Yeah, they were huge. Yeah, they were big. And I think the last confirmed sighting was in the 1760s. Yeah, they've been we gone for a while. Them all. 
Um, but I was looking more into them and those were the confirmed sightings, but there's been fossils found in Japan and California. Oh, wasn't the Japan one fairly so, recently that they found that, I think? I think so, yeah. Yeah. So that, that used to be the range, but then we killed them back to Like Alaska. many things. <laughs> but yeah, they were pretty similar. The only main difference was their size and they actually lacked teeth too. Oh, interesting. So, because I know that one of the main differences between the dugong and the manatee is the shape of the tail. So the dugong right. is more triangular and the a manatee is more rounded. So the stellar sea cow, was it more round or was it, it was more, more like a... Fish, like the dugong. Like the dugong? It, it basically oh, looks like a giant dugong. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. I always found the dugongs to look weird to me because it does look, has a more like a dolphin tail, but, and yeah. then it's a manatee basically. And it, like, you look like you're put together wrong. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's probably the obvious difference between the two, if you would just, because most people I know have never heard of a dugong. Yeah, so, well, especially up in North America here, like, you're like, what? Imagine manatee with a fluke, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I had uh, recently had a, a talk that a little girl asked about the dugong, not the manatee, and I was like, hmm. impressed young lady. And I've never seen a wild manatee, but I've seen wild dugongs. <gasps> See, I've seen wild manatees, but not wild dugongs. Yeah. I there, can't there. talk about it too much, but I did. I helped with some research down in Australia when I was there studying oh, cool. abroad, and they were focusing on the population there in Morning Bay, who's really susceptible to disease. So we were doing health assessments there and right. tissue samples and all that. So do they have the same? So because I know in, in Florida, because I used to live in Florida, so manatees, um, they, you know, congregate toward in warm areas. So at at, at um, power plants and stuff that have warm water coming out. Do they have the same issue with that in Australia with the dugongs? I, I could tell. I think the temperatures are fairly stable there because it's pretty similar year round in the ocean, I guess, off the coast. Right. But they don't seem to have problems with that. Okay. Yeah, because it, it, it becomes a problem because if they get used to having those and then that thing shuts down and they don't have that warm water and they can get very stressed and it's not great. Right. I think the temperature fluctuations are more stable so they don't have to that's good. Resource that as much. That's cool. Um, but yeah, I guess in general, there's technically three species of manatee, which is the West Indian, the West African, and the, it's in the Caribbean. It's the, oh no, it's the Amazonian, African, and West Indian. West Indian. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah, West right. Indian is the one is in, in Florida. Right. Yeah. And Confusingly enough. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks. And these guys are in the same clade as elephants, which I think is pretty oh my, cool. Because yeah. they're and they're uh, herbivores. Herbivores, yeah, that's the main yeah. key difference between other marine mammals. I think they're the only herbivorous marine mammal. I be believe so. I don't know of any. Every, all the other ones are mollusks and fish sometimes, but that's usually mainly just they're on the seaweed or <laughs> kelp or whatever. Um, but when you I, see them in the in the aquariums, they they throw big heads of lettuce. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Watch on those. Yeah. The elephant fact was cool to me, though, because I was looking into it. Dugongs don't have it, but manatees have nails mm -hmm. on their flippers. They, they look like the, yeah, they look like the, on their flippers. They look, they like, look the, like the toes of an elephant, the way they're mm -hmm. placed. Yeah. And then they oh, wow. look like an elephant does and nose and all that. So it's mm -hmm. pretty cool. But Super cute. I think they're used to help move on the bottom to get their food and all that. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, not, they're not long, but... Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think... Oh, the, they have the densest bones in the animal kingdom, or amongst them. Wow. Oh. Really? I think that might help with buoyancy. Yeah, because like, they got a lot of fat. Yeah, they have a lot of fat, and then it helps bring them down. <laughs> right. It yeah. balances yeah. out that large amounts of blubber <laughs> that they've got going on there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they can live pretty long, too. I think dugongs... They recorded up to 70 years. Wow. And then they had a manatee in captivity live up to 68 years. Oh my gosh. That's a lot longer than I would have expected for some reason. I, I don't know why, but. Max, yeah. Huh. Well, they don't have that many predators, really. No, not really. Sharks they like were sharks. the main ones, but not yeah. really that big of a but Especially where they're at, there's no other like larger marine mammal that really eats True. them. Yeah, Just dugongs people. have killer whales, but not really. Yeah, like in Florida, don't have to worry about that. No killer whales there. <laughs> dugong ring is larger than I thought. It's Australia and the Indo-Pacific and East Africa. Oh, wow. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, I was just going to ask you, yeah, what was their range difference? Gotcha. 
yeah versus the amazon is in the amazon and right west indian is caribbean and all that mm -hmm. but uh, cool. i think i mean since they look similar their skulls are way different too the teeth and the dugong are continually replaced and they're all molars right or i'm sorry in the manatee in the manatee <laughs> but then the dugong doesn't have replaceable teeth and it has actual tusks too kind of like an elephant would but oh oh wow that's weird. interesting i wonder molars, canines huh i wonder if the like what came first the chicken or the egg was it the dugong or was it the manatee or were they both at right. the same time because <laughs> from that it sounds like they're more closely related to elephants than manatees but that could maybe just, just some parts sure. yeah there's different they just got you get this part and you get this part right <laughs> <laughs> you get the nails you get the tusks right, right? exactly <laughs> Exactly. So what are the, the tusks though, but they don't come out. Like they're just no, in mean, the mouth. Sometimes you can see in the males are more prominent. You can okay. kind of see them if they're chewing. And the females will get them, but not till much later, I saw. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. I didn't really know that about dugongs. I just was like that yeah. there's manatees with the fluke tail. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. So there I guess the biggest I guess with issues, like you mentioned, the power plants, they just need warmth for the manatees. It's not as big of an issue with the dugongs, but dugongs are apparently really susceptible to disease, like I mentioned. Oh, okay. I think 30% of dugong deaths on the east coast of Australia was from disease. Wow. Oh, wow. That's, so that's why high. they're doing the health assessment. Yeah. Out there. Yeah. So they're trying to figure out on just like multiple diseases. Hmm. Do they know why they're more susceptible at all? Or I think the disease is more prevalent or present there on the east okay. coast there. And I guess it would be more likely to spread in warm water potentially too, depending on what type of disease it is. If it's bacterial right. or fungal, that would be more easy to spread. In and it must water. spread easily too, wouldn't they? Because they're, they're pretty solitary. They only really right. come together to breed. Yeah, saying that, and manatees are different because manatees aggregate all the time. Yeah. Um, they're usually in, in group. I mean, they're, they can be solitary too, but they're found in groups. And especially, like I said, when they go to those power plants, um, <laughs> they they literally will huddle and climb on top of each other to get into that warmth. Like you'll see a picture of by the outflow of the, of the power plant and you can't see water. It's just <laughs> like these big stones of manatees. Right. Um, but they are specifically because if they don't, if they, they have a very small range of temperatures that they can deal with. And outside of that, they get cold water, cold stress syndrome, I think it's called, or cold water stress, uh, stress syndrome. They technically don't have blubber. It's just thick skin, right? Versus fat. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. Which so, again yeah, is kind of more like the elephant with that really thick skin. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. So they and they so they get basically cold water stress and then basically other opportunistic things take over and so they'll have um, and if you get a cold snap in Florida you'll you'll be like okay let's wait for it and you'll just have a whole bunch of manatees dying. Um, I think manatees are fairly susceptible to parasites too. Hmm of that reason it's, you know constantly hitting each other or in contact with each other and mm. their immune right. systems down and yeah right easily makes spreadable sense. makes sense sure group, as, as we know now in the during the pandemic groups are fun but also <laughs> <laughs> can be a problem <laughs> cool Very cool is that it for the dugong and manatee i think so all right that's pretty cool i did not know quite a few things about the dugong on that now. Well, see, I, and that's the things I've never seen either. So I'm like, I kind of, I mean, I know there, I know what the differences are with the tail, but other than that, I'm kind of like, I don't really know what the differences are. So yeah, you've never go. really been like, because you're like a rock in the North Sea, and now you're up here. Like, there's yeah. no way you're gonna. I mean, I well. went to Australia, but we didn't. I was, I was on in Western Australia, so we didn't have dugongs out there. Well, and even yeah. I lived in Florida for 17 years, and I saw manatees a handful of times. And I was out on the water quite a bit, but it's you have to be in the right places, and you know. Yeah, yeah the only reason I saw them was because we actually went to go look for them. Right. On the right. Yeah. yeah. There were dugong crossing signs in the water, though. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> <I> like that. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hilarious. They have in Florida. They have the go slow signs because for uh, manatee, um, which actually is very interesting. I was reading some studies about that. Because they get hit by boats a lot. That's they're one of their main right, big problems because they're fairly they're big fat elephants in the water and they're, and they're slow. slow. Yeah, but they can move fast when they want to. So they actually have some like drone footage and stuff like that. And they saw like when an animal was like, oh my God, and they, they could zoom pretty quickly, not for very long, but they could do that. But 
Um, and then they were looking at the whether they can hear the boats or not and looking at their hearing range and actually they can hear the faster boats better than the slower boats, mm -hmm. I think it was. So it put yeah. a whole thing of like, well, should we be making people go slow? But the one issue is that even if you're if you're going slow, you have more time to avoid the manatee. Reaction. The problem is when they freak out, they're just going to dart one way. Well, you, they could end up darting into your path because right. they don't know where they're going. And if you're going fast, then you're just going to you know speed bump them, and that's going to be it. Kind of so. like with deer around here, <laughs> where it's like you know if you again like you could just try to zoom past them if they're just standing there, but if they decide to freak out, they could just run into your run car. Your car. Sadly, <laughs> they do sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So going slow, even if they can't hear them as well, is probably the better the better option better to option. be able to avoid avoid them. But they actually will they can identify them, do make their scars. And I think that it was a, a ridiculous percentage of the population that has scars from boats. Like almost all of them do, something of some kind. So yeah. yeah. But who doesn't have scars from boats? Polar bears. <laughs> There you go. They might have scars from other things, but probably not. I mean, maybe now they might. Yeah, there's good, more, there is more traffic happening up there. So yeah, let's talk about the polar bear. So uh, this one is, I feel like this is one that people may or may not think of as a marine mammal, because I feel like this is one that because it gets a lot more play on things like um, documentaries and like National Geographic stuff. Like, they're so maybe, cool and cute. Because they're super cool. But yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like this is one that maybe people would think of as a marine mammal, but basically they are, they're a bear. They're a true bear. They're in the um, Ursus family. So similar mm -hmm. to like brown, bear, brown bears, black bears. It's hard to say. Um, and their Latin name is Ursus maritimus, shockingly meaning marine sea bear. bear. <laughs> um, so their other names, which was actually really fun looking at their other names. So they are also known as the white bear. Again, not surprisingly, because they're white. Um, <laughs> Nanook. Um, and then oh, yeah. in- Oh, there was, Inuit, a, there was a movie. Yes. I think it was, was called Nanook. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which means, I believe, ever wandering one. It's oh, from the Inuit. That's cool. Um, they're also in other languages for other people. They are, one of their names is Lord of the Arctic, which I just thought was so cool. <laughs> that's and great. the best Lord one, the, the best one, in my opinion, was from the, uh, hopefully I'm getting this right, the Sami or Lap indigenous people. So they're in Northern Europe. Their name for it, I'm not going to attempt to say their name in their language, but that oh. means old man in the fur cloak. Ooh, that's cool. Isn't Do they have... Cool? Do they have um, like stories? Yeah, oh, where okay. so it's basically it's kind of like uh, okay. anyone watching in Scotland the story of the selkie, or if you know anything about the story of the selkie, where basically someone is uh, wearing the pelt of a seal, but then when they go into the water with it on, they turn into a seal, and so when they come on land, they can shed the skin and walk around as a human. So kind of a similar story to that, where they That's can I was walk around as people, or you know, put that on and become a bear. Cool. So I thought that was really cool. Um, they, so technically they count as a marine mammal because they actually spend the majority of their lives in the ocean. Um, and they are, they have really unique adaptations to life in the water and on land. Um, so because of that, they are counted as a marine mammal and also the fact that they are entire, well, not entirely point, dependent, but pretty much it's entirely dependent, dependent on, yeah. right, exactly right. on the marine environment for food. Um, so they are the largest carnivorous land mammal, which is cool uh, just to begin with that's just super mm -hmm. cool um seven to eight feet long typically um and a lot of times you know when they're just walking they're walking like a bear but like any other bear they can stand up on their hind legs when they're posturing when they're fighting um and they're pretty intimidating when they're standing on their hind legs they can be over 11 feet tall <laughs> which is like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna respect Bye -bye. that now um so males away. are bigger than females like like most um of Most of the skew, yeah. Um, they can weigh more than 1,700 pounds, the males. Um, females are typically around 1,000 1, pounds or less. So kind of around about that 1,000 to 1,500 pound mark in terms of weight. Um, and interestingly with these guys, their weight actually fluctuates drastically depending oh, yeah. on what time of the season you're looking at their weight. So they will do quite an intensive fast period, um, especially the females if they are um pregnant and or giving gonna give birth to cubs um so they can be up to about 50 percent heavier after a good feeding season than they were at the beginning of it wow. um and one of the really interesting things with them too is unlike other bears they don't actually hibernate at all 
Um, the only time that they will do anything like that is females who are pregnant and basically like ready, you know, being pregnant and going to give birth, they will build themselves a den, um, usually out of a, like some kind of ice flow where they can like make that a secure spot or in, in the land. Typically, I think it tends to be um, kind of ice cave style. And they will be in there for a good, probably, I think it's like up to five to six months all told. Um, let's see, I had that written down somewhere. So yeah, so they can actually, they'll usually go into the den kind of just before the winter, like right at the beginning of the winter. Um, she'll give birth around midwinter and then we'll, we'll just suckle the cubs until spring, which is when they'll finally emerge. So obviously they have really fat rich milk, um, helps the cubs to, to um, get all the nutrients they need and build up their fat layer before having to venture out into the cold. I think there was um, recent, recently a, a, a documentary or a movie that came out that was following that and they had the bear the mama bear and the baby cubs coming out for the first time out of the little den so yeah i think i think there's been a couple different things of footage showing that moment but the female can fast up to 240 days jesus so the entire year (laughs) right so it's i mean typically it's around 180 days that she will go for a fast if she's if she's pregnant and then giving birth but i guess they sorry so she's desperate for food then. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Talk about so, I mean, hangry. Like, yeah, seriously. Um, so that's actually one of the longest fasts of all mammals, like ever recorded. Um, and obviously, yeah, then when she emerges, she's starving. So the cubs will actually get left on their own for the first couple of days while she goes to find food. Um, and they kind of just play around the den, I think, and um, try to stay safe from other bears and other things that would want to eat them. Um, so speaking of their adaptations again, just with the, um, the cubs obviously need a little bit of time to build up their tolerance to the cold, but that's obviously one of the things they live in the Arctic, right? So they're in the Arctic circle. Um, and they are pretty uniquely adapted to living up there. So one of the things that was actually really cool is, you know, that one of the main things they're known for is their white coat. Um, that the coat's actually not white at all. Oh, that's right. They have black skin underneath, but their hairs are hollow, so they reflect the light, and they, like they also reflect the they? snow. Yeah. Yeah. They're, well, yeah, they're hollow, so yeah. they're they're just they're see through. Yeah. Um. So basically, because it's a thick layer of fur, it reflects the light, which is bouncing off the snow, and so makes their skin makes their fur look white, which I just thought was really this cool. Really cool. Um, and also, again, kind of similar to the sea otters, their hollow hairs act in a similar way to uh, trap um, trap the heat inside, prevent heat loss. Um, and, and the black skin also, if it's, is it going to absorb more heat than Correct. Yeah. Than white skin? Yeah. Um, and then below the fur, they have a thick fat layer when they're feeding well. Um, so that, again, can help with the insulation and to trap that heat. And one of the things that I thought was really cool as well, because it's in some ways kind of counterintuitive, but actually their size is also an adaptation to preventing heat loss. Hmm. So it's kind of a balance because the bigger you are, the more heat you lose, but the bigger you are, the more heat you can generate as well. Hmm. So basically it's this kind of fine balance between them being larger, therefore able to generate more heat. So in theory, even though they're losing more heat because they're large, if they have all these other adaptations and they can generate more heat because of their large size, they can actually maintain a fairly constant heat level, which is kind of cool and kind of weird, but pretty yeah. cool. Interesting. Um, so those are some of the things that they have that are adapted to their environment. In terms of going in the water, um, they have webbing between their toes. So they actually have kind of webbed feet. So that helps them to walk on snow, first of all, kind of acts like a snowshoe. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. And then also when they're paddling, obviously through the water, it's more like a natural paddle so they can um, swim a little bit easier. Um, and also it can also help them from falling through ice because it helps distribute their weight better. And their feet also have a non-slip surface on the pads of their feet, which I thought was super cool. So that, oh. that stops them from slipping on the ice. That's cool. Isn't that neat? Necessary? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Well, especially when they're trying to hunt prey too, it's kind of like, oh, sorry, I skidded out. Just yes. wait for me. I'll be right back up. Um, also, there's not like bountiful, plentiful food everywhere, so they gotta you gotta right. make sure when you when you're gonna get it, 
you're going to capture it. You got everything in your favor to get it. Yeah, exactly. Right. So one of the, the, the main things that they eat, obviously, are seals up there. Um, primarily, it's uh, ringed seals and bearded seals are, are the main ones that they'll take, which are both common to the Arctic, but they'll take other kinds of seals where they can. They'll take small mammals if they can. They'll, uh, we'll talk about in a little bit. They will kill and eat belugas, which we talked about mm -hmm. in the first episode Beluga. of Marine mm -hmm. Mammals Highlights. So that's where they have the like the ice the, for all of those guys. They have to come up to breathe. So the the polar bears will be around those holes, right? And so that's like, so that's kind of the problem that we get into. Uh, one of the one of the main reasons that polar bears are being talked about at this point in time is obviously because of climate change, and they are right. so dependent on the sea ice. So part of that is because um, the seals themselves use the sea ice um, for their foraging purposes. So they're kind of intrinsically linked to where the sea ice is, which is why the polar bears will hang out around the sea ice because that's where the seals are. If you have less sea ice, it means that to find more sea ice, you have to swim to it. So that's actually one of the biggest things they're seeing right now is polar bears being drowned, yeah. which get, pretty much never exhausted. happened. Right, it pretty much never happened before. Um, and now they're having to potentially swim like, I think one of the things that I read was saying that one polar bear had been tracked swimming nine days across open ocean to try try to find sea ice so this is in the arctic right so you're talking like huge waves potential storms yeah. um they're already you know nutritionally stressed because they're looking for food so they're obviously you know they're not necessarily at a great level of health at that point um and like i said this was something that you really weren't seeing before um because of that uh, because they're struggling to find food like i said they are now being seen to do get a little bolder uh obviously like there's been problems with them going into towns and villages raiding trash um they can be pretty aggressive towards people they're eating more belugas which they typically would not do um that was something that was just a risky strategy for them to try to take such a large whale and they're doing that more creepily enough they're also seeing rates of cannibalism among polar bears increasing i guess it was something they would occasionally see but yeah. now it's like Oh, times call for desperate measures. Right. Like you're you're doing this more than you were before. Yeah. So like I said, I mean they're incredible, but they're just they're they're struggling right now just with everything in the and in the Arctic. They are hybridizing now too with yeah, it, so they're, grizzlies they're closest, or browns. Grizzlies. So their closest relative is the brown bear, but the grizzlies are are typically more in that range. So those are really the ones that they have the ability to mate with because they're right there. <laughs> right. Um yeah, so like I said, I mean, super, super cool. Um, they're, they're, like I said, that's the, that's the problem. That's why they're a marine mammal is this, they're intrinsically linked to the ocean, but with the lot, you know, retreating sea ice, they're less and less able to do what they normally do, so. Yeah, I think one of the um, poster, show, poster pictures for climate change is like the polar bear on this little ice floe that's floating out into the, and there's no ice anywhere and you can't leave it. Yeah. yeah it's bad. So. so yeah, there you go. That's the polar cool. bear. All right. Well, we have um, some pretty cool weirdos. <laughs> the polar bear, who is the biggest carnivore. We have the dugongs and manatee. I know the, the manatee, the um, myth of the mermaid comes from that. And uh, so it's kind of funny where you think, uh, what were these sailors looking at? Or what, can, do they have like beer goggles on or something? <laughs> like, it's a beautiful mermaid, human or anything. This is big giant manatee in the water. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, so we have that the manatees, and then of course our river otters, which are actually marine mammals, um, which Who are super fun to play with. Uh, not to play with, but super fun. They play a lot. I was gonna say, whoa, no, don't, no, don't, don't encourage people to do that. <laughs> no, they play with each other. Is what I was trying to say. Yes, they're fun they're to watch play. while they're playing together. Exactly. Um, don't just don't get too close the river because otter, please. they're very stinky. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> they can be aggressive sometimes, yes. as any animal can be, but um, yeah. yeah, so that's it for this week of the weirdos. Um, we'll see you next time. I'm not sure what we're going to do, but we'll have some fun marine mammals to discuss. Um, so that's our episode for today, and we will be back uh, in the next week or two with some more marine mammals for you to um, hear about and decide which one you think is best. And um, if you want to hear about a particular marine mammal, a particular marine mammal, please let us know in the comments or email us. We're happy to yep. discuss uh, any any of them, and hopefully, we'll yeah. Get to all and of also, them. let us know which one you thought was the coolest. That's right. Which one did? Which one of or us convinced you the most about? Them? <laughs>
<laughs> our animal. Right. All right. So that's it. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Each species we discuss has their own write up in our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks. <laughs>